Amen. Good to be with you tonight. My name is Parker Kerstell. If you don't know me, I'm the college pastor here at Grace. I hope you really believe me when I say that it is my honor and my privilege to be with you for the next uh, couple weeks. We are going to be in the book of Leviticus. So if you would turn to that book, Leviticus chapter 1, I just want to read the first two verses. And then we'll dive into what the Lord has to say to us. Leviticus chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it reads like this. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. Would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, would, would you show us the truth that saves? We pray this only in your name. Amen. This is a series uh, that was birthed out of, it really first kind of came to my mind and my idea through a habit that I've begun to cultivate at the beginning of each new year. I've only done it twice. Um, but there is this Bible reading program called Shred, and it's kind of modeled after, you know, uh, along the same lines of an idea of you, you know, work out really hard for 30 days and you shred, uh, you know, your body and your muscles and all that kind of stuff. Similar idea here. The, the goal of this Shred Bible reading program is to read the entire Bible in one month. And if you were to do that, it would genuinely take you probably about two or so hours a day, depending on how quickly you were to read it. And... Um, this last year was the closest I've ever gotten. I didn't finish it all the way in January. I finished it into the month of February, but uh, I, I've really enjoyed doing it. And part of the, the goal, and this is where Leviticus really struck me, was through this Bible reading program, is part of the goal of this is so much of our Bible reading, which is a, a wonderful way to do it, is chapter by chapter. You know, you don't really spend much more time than a chapter a day studying God's Word, most likely. And it's much less frequent of an occurrence for us to, to really sit down at, at one sitting and read through a whole book. And especially with a book like Leviticus, which has 27 chapters, you wouldn't be done with it until essentially a month uh, was completed. And over reading Leviticus through this Bible reading program called Tread, over the course of about two days, um, the, the Holy Spirit just really illuminated some things to me. And uh, that's what I'm excited to share with you tonight. But... If you find yourself in the category of people uh, who have passed by or spent very little time with Leviticus, you're normal. Uh, there's nothing strange about that. It is a very complex book. Believe it or not, uh, Leviticus actually used to be the first book that Jewish children would study in the synagogue, which really blew my mind when I found that out. But it's, it's a compliment to our women's ministry, actually. They tackled this book, uh, I think, several years ago and, and went through the whole thing. Really impressive that they did that. I don't think you hear of too many people studying that way. But um, if you ever really look at how the, the contemporary Christian world approaches the book of Leviticus, it tends to be the last part of the Bible that people really study seriously, or it's one of the quickest ones to pass over. Much of the reason for that is that Leviticus is largely, uh, it largely deals with these ideas uh, that seem very far away from us. They, they, feel, they don't feel culturally relatable to us. Um, it, it's incomprehensible subjects. The, the matters just don't really feel like home. Uh, some of those things are ritual uh, or sacrifice. All these regulations, again, it appears to have nothing to say to you and me. However, it is the book in the Old Testament, the chief book in the Old Testament, Leviticus, that foreshadows and speaks to the atonement and the coming Messiah more than any other book. And those are some things that I want to eventually get into. But really at the heart of this passivity to the book of Leviticus that I think we can all relate to at some point in time is this. It comes down to a question like this. Why would we spend time looking at the shadow when we possess the substance? We have Christ. We're in the new covenant. Why, why do we go back to the old? What's the, the purpose in really doing that? The gospel makes little sense without Leviticus, without the old. Why? Because the gospel presumes a knowledge of certain things. There are certain things that the gospel of Jesus Christ that we know so well of in the New Covenant and uh, under the New Testament, it presumes things like that, that you have this understanding of sacrifice and atonement. Uh, 
that you have an understanding of sin and obedience, that you have an understanding of grace and mercy, of prophecy and priesthood. Can you imagine with me for a moment if all we had was the New Testament? How lost we would be and the dark we would be to this terminology and phraseology. We don't really realize how much we bank our faith on Leviticus in the Old Testament. It's one of the greatest preliminary sketches of Christ. The the truths that you and I have come to know and to love and to believe about the gospel in Christ are what they are because of this foundation that's laid down specifically by the book of Leviticus. God given it to Moses to us. It's really as if the New Testament draws up these new maps for how we're to navigate our lives as believers. And the the way that we got those maps is by looking at the older charts of the Old Testament. In fact, the, the New Testament has about 40 special references to this book. Without Leviticus, again, Christianity is like a a house without a foundation. I don't think I really have to teach you that the the Bible is a story of redemptive history. Surely you have heard that phrase before, but every single book that's contained in this word and, and in the scriptures helps to paint a full picture of redemptive history. From Genesis to Revelation, God Almighty has had a purpose And his purpose is this. His purpose has always been, at least one of his great purposes has been, to dwell with his people. And we see that from the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, where uh, God places Adam and Eve in the garden. They're living under his rule and his reign, and they are experiencing the joy of that blessing, living life according to God's perfect design. You know how chapter 3 goes. Everything starts to go haywire. Adam and Eve rebel. They throw off God's rule and thus forfeit his blessing over their lives. However, no matter how greatly things, you know, go out of control and become chaotic, God's plan does not change. He has not thrown off his throne. He understands what's taking place. This is plan A. There's never been a a plan B. But Ephesians 1 verse 4 reveals something really interesting to us. It says that before the foundation of the world, so before Genesis 1-1, God chose to redeem his people through Jesus Christ, specifically Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, you know, continuing in Genesis, the story of how it goes, an offspring is promised who will destroy the works of Satan, that is Christ. That's the beginning of the story, is my point. And the Bible gives us, the Lord gives us the rest of the story. If you were to flip to the end of your scriptures, you know, the book of Revelation, you'd see where God's plan is materialized. Israel, God's people, the redeemed, the church out of every tongue, tribe, and nation, the image of God fully restored, dwelling in God's presence under his blessing and rule. No more sorrow, no more sin, no more death, no more curse. The rest of scripture from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20 and beyond is the unfolding story of how God gets us there. And my point is, Leviticus fits into that story. In fact, it is one of the key entry points for us gaining an understanding of this redemptive history. If you remember the account, Leviticus was written by Moses after God saved the Israelites from their slavery and captivity in Egypt. God leads his people to Mount Sinai. Uh, That is going to be their dwelling place for the time. And the people of Israel are camping down below the mount, and they spend their time there. And Moses makes these frequent trips up to Mount Sinai to the top of the mount or into the mount, and he spends all of this time with God hearing from him. So God leads his people to the mount. The the people stay there. And and the Lord gives Moses the Ten Commandments and the other laws. Uh, Surely you know this story. But one of the things that God gives to Moses during this time is the instructions for building the tabernacle. Now, I'm not going to do a deep dive into the tabernacle. I think, in fact, Chris did that during his series. So I encourage you to go listen to that if you need more details. But the Lord gives his chosen people instructions for building the tabernacle. And the scriptures tell us that the tabernacle was constructed on year two after Israel's deliverance from Egypt. So only two years after they've been delivered from Egypt is the tabernacle built and constructed. That is where Exodus ends. And Leviticus essentially picks right up. 
30 days later from that is where the book of Number begins. One author said this, that God took only six days to creation, but he spent 40 days with Moses in directing him to build the tabernacle and 30 in giving him the laws of the priesthood, a.k.a. Leviticus. Because the work of grace is more glorious than the work of creation. I thought that was really good. Grace? In the tabernacle? In Leviticus? Surely you have better definitions of grace than that. So over the course of a month, exactly in the middle of the tabernacle being built and the book of Numbers starting, we have these words of God to Moses, words that display the love and grace of God to his people. Before we move on, one more thing about the end of the book of Exodus. There's this fascinating question that gets brought up. Uh, look back just a little ways with me if you're there at Exodus chapter 40. I'd love for you to put your eyes on this. Exodus chapter 40, the, the end of the book. The tabernacle has been built, and these are the verses that we read. Exodus 40, starting at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Lord was dwelling in the tent in the midst of his people, but even Moses, who had been allowed at one point in time up onto the mount to meet with God, for some reason is unable to enter into this moment with God. Our passage from Leviticus 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord, it fills the tabernacle. Moses is outside and God calls to Moses. Exodus ends and Leviticus begins, leaving us kind of grabbing the edge of our seat going, why? Why was Moses unable to go in? Well, the message of Exodus was about God's approach to his people, them being brought near to God. And Leviticus is very much so going to be about the people's approach to God, and they're being kept near to him. In Leviticus, the subject is the believer's worship. Spiritual condition pervades the book. Why was Moses unable to go in? Well, the text tells you, look at it again with me, Exodus 40, verse 35, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of God. Look at our text with me. Leviticus 1, verse 1, the, the first three words, the Lord called. These opening words speak to a summons that God initiates and a desire that God has. The key message of Leviticus is found in chapter 19, verse 2, which says, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, Am holy. That is the message of Leviticus. How might a holy God dwell with an unholy people? And holiness affected every area of their life. You just read the book of Leviticus and you start to pick up on that. That the key to holiness for Israel was that their lifestyles would be distinct from the people around them. That they would be set apart. You know that language. How they worshipped, what they wore, what they ate how they loved, how they interacted with the people in and outside of their community. And at the very heart of their understanding of holiness, the very center of it, is this call to reflect the character and the nature of God. As you can imagine, and if you've read Leviticus before, being a holy people is demanding to the extreme, especially under the Old Covenant, so God in his grace does something. He provides them with something. It's, it's really a careful guidance that God gives to them. And what is this careful guidance? Well, of course, it's all of these regulations. But even deeper than that, the heart of what God really gives to them is that he speaks to them. This is a, a revelation from God. Leviticus 1 verse 1, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him. Just like in the Garden of Eden, where the, the voice of the Lord God was heard. I'd love for you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 
First uh, and Second Peter are some of my favorites in the scriptures, but turn to Second Peter 1 and, and look at verse 16 with me. We'll kind of start at the back portion of verse 16. But Second Peter 1, starting at verse 16, we'll read to verse 18. Second Peter 1, 16. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And so backtrack to Leviticus out of the midst of this majestic glory comes the voice of Almighty God. Here in Leviticus, God speaks his mind. In fact, the whole book is essentially God speaking. There's really not too many other people that say words in the book of Leviticus. The heart of our God in all his own joy, pouring himself out to a man. The great first statement of this book declares a reconciled God, that he is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He's willing to go to the depths of the riches to meet with us, even in the midst of our sin. The idea that God could speak to us is really astounding. That God does speak to us, that he would speak to us, is miraculous. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Behind this summons and this spoken word to Moses lies the desire that God has for fellowship with his people. In fact, God longs to reside at the center of this community, at the the community of his people. He has a desire for fellowship and companionship with them. Leviticus, rightly understood, is not primarily about regulation. There are lots of regulations in it. The book of Leviticus, properly understood, is about relationship. It's about a right union with God. Inevitably, the people of Israel fail at this again and again and again, as you know. Yet these opening words of Leviticus tell us that the continuing well-being of Israel, the preservation of God's people, still lies with the initiative of their God. Their gracious God, giving them instructions, giving them regulations, how their union is to be nurtured, and how they can be restored when they fail. The text tells us that there is a specific person that the Lord talks to. Who is it that the Lord called? Well, it's Moses. The the Lord called Moses and spoke to him 56 times in some variation or form. 56 times. Leviticus says the Lord spoke to Moses. The very words of God here, but it's all through a specific person, to a specific person, to the extent that we're not really used to thinking about it, thinking about Moses in this context. It's fascinating. Almost everything in the Old Testament is staked on Moses. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. In in fact, just to prove my point, the the book of Deuteronomy has this incredible statement about Moses in the end. You don't have to turn there, but I think you know it. Deuteronomy 34.10 says, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. I got this idea from Al Mohler, and I just thought it was excellent. Um, You find a phrase used throughout the scriptures. This is from 2 Chronicles 23, 18. It says, as it is written in the law of Moses, specifically the the law of Moses there. It's what I want to draw attention to. Well, Well, the law of Moses, that's kind of a confusing term if you stop and think about it. Because it's not Moses' law, right? It's God's law that he gave to Moses. And yet Moses is so much the mediator of this law. He is the one to which God has given this law to give it to his people. That, in fact, it's called his. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, there's this story of Jesus healing a leper. I'm going to read it for you from Luke 5, 14. Don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but you can. Uh, Essentially what has taken place is Jesus has just done the miraculous, 
He has healed a person and cleansed them of their leprosy. And something really fascinating takes place. Luke 5.14 says, Go and show yourself to the priest, Jesus is speaking, and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded. I don't know about you, but that, that kind of strikes me. Moses is the one giving the, the command. Jesus, God incarnate, he heals a man and tells him to go to a priest to fulfill the law of Moses. This is really just a reaffirmation of the fact that the law, the law is specifically revealed in the book of Leviticus, is not just a custom. It's not just Old Testament habit. Moses has this mediatorial role and he continually finds himself in this position of interceding for God's people. Exodus 20, verse 19, uh, it's very clear that Moses functions as a prophet. Deuteronomy 34.10, we're told that a prophet like Moses, but greater than Moses, is coming. Hebrews 3.3, we're told that Jesus, as a prophet, has more glory than Moses. He's worthy of a a greater glory than Moses. My point, and I think a, a point you could infer from Hebrews, is that Moses has a kind of glory it's, it's not, you know, however, you know, lowercase g, great he is. He's, he does not bear the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus is the divine glory and presence of God. We know that. But the significance of Moses is really pivotal here. And, and the healing of the leper in Luke 5 is a grand picture of the fact that Christ Jesus the Lord perfectly fulfills the law of Moses. Moses was unable to make purification for sins. Maybe not forever, but at one point in time, he was unable to enter the tent of meeting or the the tabernacle. You know this verse from Hebrews. Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his power, by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We understand how Jews might read this. We understand, at least in part, how the Levitical priesthood reads this book. But how should we? How should Christians read this book that is Leviticus? You should love Leviticus. You should love Leviticus because it forces you to ask the question of what is it that your faith rests upon? Not only does it force you to ask that, it forces you to answer it. One of the reasons our faith is shaky is for this very reason. We often lack a proper understanding of the context, of the foundation, of these foundational things, that the things that we know and we love and we believe We don't study them as we ought. A question I raised earlier, um, it's one that any one of us might ask when we approach the book of Leviticus, but the question I asked was, why look at the shadow when you possess the substance, right? Well, the inspired authors of the Old Testament and the New Testament have very clearly pointed out that likeness exists between the thing that is typified and the type itself. And when you and I search into those types, we find one person, Jesus. I'd love for you to look at what the scriptures say about this as well. If you turn to Colossians chapter 2, I think this will really help uh, expand this point. But Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 17 with me. There's a wonderful passage in Colossians. Colossians 2 verse 17, these are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance, or the King James Version, which I like better, uses the word body. But the body belongs to Christ. The Messiah, this Messiah that has been from the beginning, he is the object to be unveiled to mankind. The body of the law, the substance of the law from Colossians, is Christ. And the types are the series projected from him. Said another way. The Israelites in Leviticus looked upon a veiled Savior who they would never see unveiled in their lifetimes. You and I, 
under the new covenant look upon an unveiled Savior. And you and I going back to the old, we can see far better than they could the features and the form and the foundation that is Christ. They only saw the ingredients necessary. You and I have tasted and seen and partaken of at least a portion of the meal. And it ought to be a great desire of us to know more deeply the essential component parts that make up what we have partaken of. I completed my uh, second course on the Hebrew language a couple months ago. I'm taking seminary classes through RTS. By far some of the most difficult and challenging classes I've taken yet. One of the things that my professor said that struck me at the beginning was that at the onset of the course, uh, when I be began taking that class, there would be this kind of fog to the material. And if I was to be diligent and to work hard and continue to study every single day for the class, which I didn't study every single day, but the fog would begin to lift and I'd be able to understand. Now, I am by no means a Hebrew scholar at this point, but... The fog did indeed begin to lift, and I started to comprehend and understand, and my point is this, that Old Testament books like Leviticus are the same. Dr. Young is so fond of saying it, and I love that he does, and I just would uh, want to remind you of it, that this is a book that is not just meant to be read. It's meant to be studied. It's meant to be meditated on. Psalm chapter 1 encourages us in that way. And once you've really grasped the material certain truths become more and more unveiled. Over time, as you pour, pour over this law, you've moved past only seeing details. You see that this book is trying to tell us certain things. It's trying to tell you and me certain things. The psalmist writes it like this, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. What if all of a sudden, as you're studying Leviticus and you're diligently pouring over it, going again and again before the Lord to seek that understanding that only the Holy Spirit can, and you finally get past the technicalities and you come to a greater conclusion, a conclusion similar to David's here. I'm gonna close out by the last place I promised to tell you to turn to. Uh, Hebrews chapter eight. I'd love for you to go to Hebrews chapter eight as we wrap up this thought. Hebrews 8, verse 5. They, that's how the verse begins, that is the earthly tabernacle and the Levitical priesthood, that is what this is referencing, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Did you get that? Because the author of Hebrews is doing something really interesting here, really captivating. Uh, if you've ever traveled to New York City, then you know that there are separations and you know the differences between when you're walking on Times Square and the view and the perspective that you have in doing that. You know, you know the difference of that between going on top of the Empire State Building and getting a skyline view perspective of the city. You know the difference between both of those things and getting on the plane that you, that you traveled on, going home and seeing the entire state in perspective, right? The author of Hebrews is depicting something similar about what's happening in Leviticus. As they, again, that is, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, the Levitical priesthood and the Israelites as a whole, as they more and more carried out these laws, again and again lived in obedience to God's words according to Moses, said another way, the, the further they considered the copy and shadow, the more they backed up the more they looked out and the more they gazed upon Jesus Christ, they were literally being aided by God in starting to establish an awareness of how their earthly experience connected with heaven. They were able to begin to start to make more sense of their own lives as they understood them more and more through these processes and regulations. It was here in Leviticus where they began to live and understand that. If we do the same, the matters contained within this book will start to begin to feel more like home to us.